Thank you very much. Now, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Although Matt did a brief introduction of the names of the panelists, perhaps I could ask each of them to just talk a little bit, just really briefly, about what they do in their respective firms, and then we'll get into the meat of the discussion, and I'll tell you about programs in their stock firms. Uh, thanks, Ian. Hello, everyone. So, what does a crypto lawyer do? We'll see if James and I give similar answers. I, I hope so, because we know each other really well and we work together. Um, in part, the subject matter of the evening. So, if you want a project that will scale, then it better be compliant. Um, there is a kind of truism in the market that there's regulatory uncertainty in all projects. These are international projects by definition, so you're multiplying uncertainty by the number of jurisdictions that you're working in. Um, in my firm, we've got a team of people that were by and large, apart from me, in-house uh, lawyers and crypto firms. So I think what we're trying to do, and, and, um, and working closely with James and, and others, is be good supporters of the industry, understand what the industry is trying to do, how it's doing it, and uh, not be uh, the kind of lawyer where you have to explain everything that you feel um, you shouldn't be charged for uh, to get. So, um, a group of people inside uh, large international. Yeah, thank you, uh, Charles. Next, uh, Jake. Hi, um, so <coughs> I'm a lawyer at Garnet Cook, which is kind of now almost three firms together. So the Stevens Law guys have joined us last month. Uh, group called Mark Winters are joining us as of Wednesday next week. Who are do they did one in ten of the successful crypto registrations in the UK before that. So we're kind of three groups now together in one bigger law firm. Um, our focus is on the regulatory side. We're interested in things like DAOs. So we're accepting payment in crypto to enable DAOs to try and get that up and running. We worked with Mauritius FSC last year to write their crypto framework. We worked with two other regulators this year to write their legal frameworks. And what we're trying to do is just create a cohesive approach internationally where people can just move to different parts and have a rough idea of what the hell's going on, even though everyone will shoot me because we're the red guy. If everyone shoots the red guy, if you see what I mean. And apart from that, in terms of Charles' question, in terms of what crypto lawyers do, I'd like probably cry and panic a lot when it all goes to shit. That probably isn't the thing that we're here for you. That, that, thank you. May I just pause there before we <laughs> ask the We've had the intros from the lawyers. The way we structured this tonight is we've got two fantastic founders creating a lot of value for the ecosystem, not just in the UK, but globally. What we're going to do tonight is we're going to have our OGs sort of explain a historical viewpoint from their businesses, what their involvement's been with the regulator in the UK and maybe other um, examples of the issues they've found within the last five, ten years of their journey. And then what we'll do is we'll open up the panel to a discussion firstly on policy to set the scene from the government level in the UK, then we'll talk about how that feeds down into the regulatory landscape, obviously we've got a live open consultation in the moment from Treasury, then we'll talk about how we compare to other jurisdictions, so a bit of international venture market, market. Then we'll finish on banking, which I know is probably dear to everyone's heart in here, especially mine, and I know Ollie's too, what they're doing. So let's first, yeah, first kick off with, with Ollie, please, in your journey. Thank you. you oh, sure. Uh, straight into the journey uh, with intros. Um, I'm not a lawyer. Um, <laughs> I'm a geek. But a geek lawyer combo is um, super powerful in getting my business set up because. Um, let me pause there and just rewind a bit. I started my career in investment banking. I was a quant engineer, mostly on structured credit desks, uh, same structured credit desks that caused uh, a lot of problems in 08 and 09. Um, and so I was part of you know that part of the bank from 04 to 09, uh, and then from 09 to 15, basically tidying that up. I was part of a bad bank that tried to unwind some of that. Um, and it was um, a very informative experience because I could see from a quantitative level what um, bad looks like. You know, we were very, very precisely wrong about the prices of those things. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it also gave me really great visibility of how a bank is built. Uh, you know, I worked in secondary markets, which is where you can trade things and structure things, but we, we were very close to primary markets where they issued things like debt and uh, equity um, and transaction banking as well. We saw how the actual money flowed. Um, and that was... Uh, Package education that no single MBA could place. Um, 
And so when I discovered Bitcoin in 2014, holy shit, um, nine years ago, I didn't realize it was that we were nearly up to that decade mark. I uh, made and lost a lot, uh, mostly lost more than I made in Bitcoin, but the lessons embedded in the code of Bitcoin were um, so, um, so powerful and so instrumental in, um, in the way we think about money, in the way we think about engineering, in the way we think about governance, uh, about decentralization, um, that um, it, it took me three years, 2017, three years later to, I guess, uh, jump from that stream, that very comfortable stream, but morally corrupt stream, uh, and, and into trying to do something uh, a little differently. It's not actually too long after I met Sean, uh, who's, you know, our past kind of, uh, met around that period, 2017, 2018. Um, but uh, yeah, so I guess, other basics, I, uh, my first degree was in AI, before it was cool. Um, I then did a business degree in 20, uh, I don't know, a long time, longer than it needed to take because I had babies and stuff. Uh, and I would met my co-founder there, uh, Eddie, the, my lawyer co-founder. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, a BCB group. So what BCB, BCB did? Tell us. Yeah, sure. <laughs> 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 What so, problems have you solved in the last few years? Well, until until March, uh, we used to describe ourselves as the Silvergate of Europe. John <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah. So that one. Yeah, we have to kind of adjust that one. Um, so cool. I know some people here. Um, you, you, lot, many people here have been on so many uh, chapters of this journey. That's going to be awesome. So you can carry on, you know, scrolling whatever you're scrolling. Um, but for the rest of you, BCB provides critical infrastructure for market makers and exchanges. Uh, any company in the crypto industry that needs that very basic building block of a bank account, that's a really boring product, it's super boring. But it's so, when it's not there, you really notice it's not there. Silicon Valley goes bust, uh, signature Silgate, suddenly people don't have a way to pay their staff, they, don't have, they can't set up their trades. Um, and it's been really useful. It's been a real shortcut in my investor pitch conversation. I don't need to explain all that. It's like, see, um, we have some value. Um, and now we bank, well, my bank is actually the wrong word, we provide payment services as a payment institution <laughs> to um, most of the you know, relevant logos in the space, uh, in, in the crypto industry. And it's our thing. We're not, it's not a side hustle. Um, we are 100% for the crypto industry. Uh, and the why, if I can just spend my 30 seconds on the why, it is that uh, when we were set up as a broker, it was actually us, Sean and I met Sean, we were also set up as a broker, which is very similar. That's how we started doing business back then. Uh, we lost our bank account, and the 18 months that I sacrificed my life and the 200k in the hole that I put myself in to get there and, uh, was like gone, like, would have been gone like that if our business was not able to survive. So my amazing wizard co founder found a way to get a institute license, and we backed ourselves. Then we backed our trading counterparties like this down the Galaxy, uh, uh, who were able to access GBP marks for the first time. And then we were like, oh, shit, this is actually what the market needs. It needs a place where you can get a bank account. Cool, let's do that. And uh, one thing that's another, and now we've got like 200 million in payments, um, uh, which the FCA are very interested in. And it's fine, we have all the data. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's the short story. Yeah, th thank you very much, Ali. And, and, and providing banking rails for crypto businesses is a bear bug of mine. Um, I'll get on to the sort of advocacy piece that we did at Crypto UK to try and improve this. But without the likes of B2B in the UK and obviously the three names that have recently failed, crypto businesses won't be able to, wouldn't be able to function because they have liabilities to pay staff, to pay suppliers in fear. <coughs> so, thank you. And now over to you, Sean, you're in chat. Hi, it's Sean Kinnan, founder of GreenGage, uh, a, a slightly different business to BCB, and I'll explain why. Um, but in a similar space, offering banking services to crypto companies, and more the base of the pyramid, we're not focused on the market makers, the exchanges, but more the startup firms. Uh, and we also have a platform business to surface debt, B2B, across traditional sources of money. So we're focused on the SME market for that, um, as well as uh, digital sources. We can do loans against crypto, etc. Um, for not using our own balance sheet, and I'll explain why I don't necessarily want to be a full bank, and I was just talking to Charles about this. Um, I think uh, a full banking license is very interesting, but uh, a ring fenced bank for us is probably more sensible. Um, my own journey is as a banker, unsurprisingly. Um, I started at uh, a division of Credit Suisse, uh, where I set up a bank in the UK in 2010. 
fascinating kind of machine behind it, the Credit Suisse, which no longer exists. Um, uh, but uh, the journey of getting my head around and setting up the bank was fascinating to credit and underwriting and, and all these different pieces of a puzzle. I loved, I loved that. Um, and after that, I sold that business uh, within Claret and Lloyd, which is the Credit Suisse division, to uh, Falcon Private Bank, uh, which was the first bank in the world to do crypto. Uh, and that was back in uh, 2017. We had accounts that people were uh, buying Bitcoin and holding it with us. We used Bitcoin Suisse then for trading and uh, custody. Uh, and I think, like Ali, we had a moment where there was a lightning bolt, uh, or a light bulb. Uh, well, I saw this was the, the future of the back end of finance, and we were getting lots of requests from corporates at all, which we weren't really good at the service uh, for transactional banking services. Um, hence, hence uh, me setting up brokerage desk, which is how we met, um, because I wanted to get my head around it. I wanted to get the cut and thrust of how do you actually move crypto and fiat. And I'm not a trader, and I realized pretty early on that I needed to port that business and sell it to someone. And Paul helped me actually in that, that time. This is way back when, when we first met uh, to, to, to find something. Did he introduce us? I think he might have introduced us actually. <laughs> well, or there might have been a lawyer that did. Yeah, Phil. Uh, and uh, thankfully, I, I was able to sell that business and then just focus on building. At the time, we called ourselves DAG and then Green Gage Pool because we had a lawsuit. Because <laughs> <laughs> Digital Asset Group was Blood Masters. Um, and then DAG is um, uh, cheap shit in Australian English. So not really a good name if you're moving internationally. Uh, with DAG. Um, uh, so, what, what we're doing now uh, and why we're kind of focused on the non banking activities uh, but payment services uh, is the idea of doing non fractional reserve payment activities, um, but in a way that has client money and a third party custodian. I want to be Web3 enabled because the idea of having loans is something that our clients want. And unlike Ali, we're, we're looking at <coughs> crypto companies as a good client base, but not exclusively. We have clients in the high net worths uh, who are also businesses that are fiduciary structures with uh, trusts with foundations. And I wanted to have that wider base of clients because for us, it's, it's giving clients access to initially accounts, but also <coughs> personal service. And the idea of having a platform with that um, means we can surface product between and amongst our clients. Uh, so it's not just the old school debt, it's also the new stuff we get out as well. So that's where we are, and we've launched. So it's been five years in the making, but finally we got there. Well, let's give a round of applause for that too. Right, well, thank you very much for that. Let's get into the, the meeting discussion. Then there will be opportunity for questions if you have some for, for our two panels on the panel today. So as I said, let's start at the top, government policy. You'll be aware that, in fact, a year ago, um, I remember I was at Bitcoin Miami when the then EST, or City Minister, said that UK is going to be a crypto hub. And so we knew that the government at the time um, had a strategy to make the UK in sync with its FinTech policy strategy, which has been really successful, to push forward with um, this announcement um, and so a year has passed and a number of things have happened so so let me open it up to the panel sort of high level you know what let's let's start with James because I know you're pretty active in, in, in the discussions um, with regards to this you know what's your sense of where we are at the moment with what you see today um, so today I think you've had a big issue in terms of giving the regulator the wrong tools so what you had is, is just the obsession with money laundering within crypto was in part driven by the fact that the fifth money laundering directive was passing through Europe at the time crypto hit the newspapers. And the reason that they went for money laundering crypto is that is what the Europeans at the time were legislating about. What you then got is you get someone like the FCA who would be given the power to registration for crypto and you would have power only to look at the money laundering side of it, but given the nature of the regulator as a conduct regulator, that is not what it wanted to do. It wanted to do conduct, because that is what the FCA's objective is in most of the sectors. What we've got at the moment is a really exciting time. There's two things are happening at the moment. There's good news and bad news for crypto. The first bit, which is the good news, the FCA now have the tools on the conduct side. Now that sounds bad in the sense of, yes, 
people always have the actual regulator being more power. But if you see some sensor having the right tools, it can be a good thing. And the regulator is going out and he's talking to people and he's having chats. And if you're going to talk to the FCA, this is the moment to do it because they're working out what the rules are. The second element to this and the battleground for the next year, which no one's paying enough attention to, is advertising, financial promotions. Every regulator is looking at this because I the way things are at the moment is you look at the regulator, you go, fuck that. I'm off to find a country. I have my favorable uh, country called Prospera. We got on the phone with the legislature, and they said, you tell us what laws you like, we'll write them to you. As long as we don't piss off the SEC, it's law. So we can't give kill me to Americans. We can't piss off the SEC. Apart from that, just tell us what you'd like to say. I love those guys. We never use them, but I just really wanted to just sit there and go, today we will legalize penguins and something equally fall through. Anyway, which way, on a slightly more sane note, um, you could dodge the whole system. The financial promotion rules around advertising are going to kill that, the same way that for hedge funds, it killed past the Caribbean for hedge funds. We've been here before, we've done it before, the system can work, but this is the moment not to run from regulation, but to run to regulation to get it to work. Because the ability to just dodge jurisdiction is dying, and what's left is that you have to face what regulation is there, but what you've got, you've got people who want it to work. The FCA is not sitting again, we hate crypto. The FCA is sitting again, we don't understand it, we need to get it right, we think it's very risky. Um, and that's the moment to come in. And at the moment, you know, you've got FTX and the press voice. Well, now, FTX uh, was wonderful, because all the problems, good old fashioned regulated problems, we didn't have answers to. And when we spoke to regulators, they were fine, they were happy, they understood the problems in FTX. So actually, they are not a problem of regulators hating this. We're a problem of regulators fear of the unknown. And that's the moment to grab it. And that's why this is both exciting, but at the same time, it has to be taken because you basically just run a time. So we, 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 it's difficult to not cross over from policy, which is obviously the government has the power, to issue legislation, privately set in some circle, with what the FCA and other agencies, from well, you know, it's the banking sector, potential regulation then they act on that. So I think, yeah, let's go back and forth on these two. And you talked about the financial promotions and then that was in the uh, Financial Market Service Bill, crypto adverts will fall under the FPO financial promotions rule. But that, that was fought with issues because there was no crypto firm that was registered or as an authorized person, not to get into the detail. But the industry was able to lobby government to get a carve out for those that are on the money laundering regime, the fast registration. So these are the things that the industry deals with to make sure that the, the regulation and the policy doesn't stifle innovation. But to sort of on that on that note, let let bring in Charles. So I know you've been in the weeds for the last three or four years working with the industry on these you know new novel issues. And do you think that the UK's policy position with the current government has been positive for us? Um, so I, I think we're... Forget the FCA, we've got to yeah, talk about it in a minute. So we're approaching um, a point where there may be a change of government, and it could be a, a significant change in policy. So we've got the current government, which has a libertarian low regulation uh, focus, and the the view around the UK being a crypto asset hub is connected to that. So what they mean by that is that it would be um, a financial centre for crypto assets, um, uh, regulation um, facilitative, and, and sort of building on James' points. Um, there's a pretty good possibility that in the next 18 months there will be a change of government. And the, the, the Labour Party in this don't see currently um, so much the opportunity around the financial markets infrastructure that the current government see. They see uh, consumer harm issues that need to be addressed around, well, how is crypto different from uh, the betting shops that are populating the high streets of my constituency? So there's a kind of, what, what's crypto ever done for um, people in the UK? Now, together with, um, with your body and many others, the, the case is there to be made around jobs, tax, bringing people back onshore who went offshore, and the, the tax base leaving the jurisdiction. Um, I think you, you, it, the issue to some extent 
addresses itself for the reasons that James describes, that in a, that the time of these being unregulated assets where there was the ability to kind of um, get around avoiding um, and regulation is, is, is gone, you can't do that. And uh, the time where it was easy to lobby against things like Mika or just applying traditional financial regulation um, on top of the unregulated assets, bringing them inside regulation, not with newly um, created uh, bespoke regulation, but just dropping traditional regulation on top of it. Um, FTX kind of put pay to that special pleading on behalf of the crypto industry. So what does it mean in that period that, that, that James describes? Um, so there is a, uh, there remains a high level act of activity, as, as we would all say, you, you can't read anything about activity in the market from the Bitcoin price, it's not a proxy, so we, we all have people saying to us, you know, well, presumably that was fun while it lasted, what are you going to do now? <laughs> so the builders are still building, and, and I think the, the key that we would all be seeing is, uh, so to some extent, the market has washed out some of the less well-funded projects, so kind of speculative um, small teams without um, institutional substantial funding, there are just fewer of them around. Um, the regulation is, is coming, as James describes. So there's an acceptance now in the industry that, that, that they will <coughs> they'll be operating in a regulated environment, whichever party we have in government. And there's the opportunity um, that more are seen to partner with, we'll talk about banks later, but the traditional fintechs. So you can only do that if you're regulated, you can't have a conversation with a US investment bank if you're going to tell them that you're um, uh, based in the Seychelles and don't have commissions in the UK. So people are kind of tuning up for the next phase of the market, which is the institutional partnerships and so on. I, I think the, the question I have around the, the regulator is, I think because crypto is two things, Crypto is the, the uh, Bitcoin ETH and all of the coins there. It, it's also um, tokenization of traditional financial assets. Um, it's much more comfortable for the regulator to think about tokenization of traditional financial assets. That's just a digitalization, um, a digital transformation project, um, simplification, automation, all of these great things. The underlying assets are the things that they're familiar with. So. I think there's, there is a, a risk for maybe the folks in the room here who, who like crypto native projects that the regulators and politicians will choose to interpret crypto as tokenized securities. Um, or how that kind of plays out, we'll see. I, I think they're still not sold on the, so maybe the use cases for natural markets infrastructure that is starting to be better understood and accepted. I'm not sure so much that they really see Bitcoin as store of value, medium exchange, speed of account, the things that they're familiar with. So they will regulate in the way that they have always regulated, which is why it's so important to pick up on, on, on James's point that they have the right tools. Um, the politics of it, I think, are up in the air because we're not going to have much of a, uh, a runway beyond <coughs> the, regu yeah, the new regulations coming in before there's potentially changing up. So let's now move to those folks that are actually building companies having to deal with these issues. That's all very well the government saying, yeah, we're going to be the crypto hub. But as we know, the devil's in the detail when you get to being regulated. So perhaps let, let's start. With Ollie, you know, what's your view around the, the two aspects? Both of which, yeah, 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 we're going to be the hub, but on the ground when you're dealing with regulators. Um, there have been some of these uh, all-party parliamentary groups, some of which the UK have been, uh, you know, parallel with. And um, when you're sitting with the MPs and you're talking about super abstract digital forms of money. Uh, and those who haven't realized that they're speaking to MPs who need to look after their, their um, constituencies are going to how cool zero knowledge proofs are and how, you know, stop how 
Like, why do they need to care? Why do UK MPs need to care about crypto in a country in which money basically works? Um, this is the point. It's not systemically important enough yet to be noticeable enough yet for the FCA to invest enough in, in, in it. The FCA are hopelessly under-resourced to address all the nuances of crypto. Um, so yeah, they started, as James pointed out, with AML, it was the flavor of the day, it was what the EU were designing at the time, and it's important to not launder money. Great, that's, that's a solid starting point. Um, but the thing is, crypto <coughs> innovation is so damn fast. The, the regulators are just not going to keep up, so they have to look at bigger um, macro pieces of the puzzle. But winding back to how this plays against the policy makers, those who represent us, um, it's really hard to get them to care because um, you know, how's the CK layer two thing that you made well done uh, going to solve the jobs in the queue in Zika? Um, so, uh, the, the, so but, 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 but we've got some definitions. That's cool because in the US, you can, you can, you know, they, they'll keep you on your toes. There's some definitions, um, but um, whichever way you play it, and Coinbase are a great player. They play by the book. Yeah. Um, they get whacked by a rule book that they have no idea what it looks like. And they're begging for rules. They're begging for definitions, some taxonomy, some definition. Mm -hmm. And um, and they only get it after the fine. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's quite perverse. So you know, <coughs> we're counting our blessings in the UK whilst the framework is still quite lean and uh, is still, still likely to borrow heavily, if not we paste Mika, it's still a lot better than, than we have there. You know, the Atlantic. From our point of view, um, we've always operated as if we were regulated. Um, uh, so we, you know, we had the KYC and AML in place. Because the first question I asked my co-founder, Ollie, was, uh, hey, is this, is this legal? And he said, well, it's not illegal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's regulated, right? There's no, there weren't any rules. Um, so we decided to treat it as if it were some vanilla asset class that you know banks or brokers or traders traded and then write everything down, keep all the records, um, um, and, um, and you know, so that's how we managed to kind of, I guess, stay ahead of, ahead of that curve a little. 